So, uh, so we're going to get started actually right now. Um, I'd like to um, introduce our opening plenary panel on uh, the six P's. Uh, this is a multi-stakeholder approach to, to driving value uh, featuring five leaders from across the, uh, the healthcare industry with unique perspectives on care transformation. Uh, we're aiming for a candid discussion of how they see their respective roles in different parts of the, uh, the healthcare system system, uh, potentially accelerating progress on alternative payment models that can make a difference. Um, let me uh, start at the far end. Uh, Bruce Broussard is president and CEO of Humana. Under his leadership, Humana has pushed towards integrated care delivery models centered on improving health outcomes, lower costs, better quality, uh, personalized member experience, a holistic approach, very much in line with what we've been talking about this morning. Bruce, thanks for being here. Next to Bruce is uh, Chris Chen, the CEO of Chen Med, an innovative physician practice um, uh, approach that in, uh, aims to be America's leading primary care provider, focusing on some of the neediest populations for enhanced primary care. Uh, Chen Med uses a model with no fee concierge style practice for the polychronic low to middle income senior population and works exclusively through a full risk capitation model. Thanks for doing your part on category four uh, payment, uh, uh, Chris. Um, and they do so in, in, in partnership with uh, Medicare Advantage Health Plans. Uh, Chin Med's grown more than 30% per year uh, since Chris became CEO in 2009. Thank you for joining us. Uh, next, uh, Susan Frampton is president of Plain Tree International, a nonprofit advocacy network of healthcare provider organizations uh, to implement comprehensive person centered models of care. She participates on the National Quality Forum's Task Force on Value Imperatives for the Next Generation of Quality and also serves as chair of the National Quality Partners Leadership Consortium, important partner groups for this effort. Thank you for being with us, Susan. Um, and uh, Nick Leshley, who, served at, who has served as president and CEO of Bluebird, uh, Chief Bluebird, I guess uh, <laughs> they call you, since 2010. And you can see Nick's got his uh, uh, biotech startup uh, outfit on. It's a, <laughs> uh, a clinical, uh, but uh, they're getting pretty far along. So Bluebird is a clinical stage company um, that's committed to de developing transformative gene therapies for severe genetic diseases, also T-cell immunotherapies for cancer, driving vision to make uh, uh, hope for a cure a reality for many patients. And Nick is, I think, representative of a lot of the transformative uh, technologies that are, uh, that are coming and that don't fit that well within the, uh, the fee-for-service model of care and payment. Uh, um, Nick, thanks for being here today. We're looking forward to hearing more about your work. And then uh, also, and definitely not least, uh, Adam Stavinsky. Uh, Adam joined Walmart in 2018 as the Senior Vice President of U.S. Benefits. Uh, there, Adam is responsible for the strategy, design, delivery of all benefits for the company's 1.5 million U.S. associates all across Walmart and Sam's Club and uh, the growing e-commerce businesses there. And he works closely with the rest of the leadership team at uh, Walmart to ensure programs meet the need uh, of Walmart's evolving businesses and their workforce and uh, implementing some really innovative models of care too that again aren't fits with uh, traditional fee for service. So I want to thank everyone uh, here for, for, for being part of this panel. And just to kick this off, I know each of you uh, is part of the, the CEO forum at the, at the LAN. Each of you has made a commitment despite obviously having some very busy uh, uh, day jobs and activities. Uh, you've committed to this effort to accelerate progress on meaningful payment reform in a way that improves outcomes and lowers costs. And I'd like to hear from you all, maybe starting uh, at the end with Bruce, on, uh, on what you're doing uh, to achieve these goals and what you think some of the most important steps and opportunities and challenges are for this uh, new land public-private effort to, to support uh, very similar goals. Well, thanks, Mark. Thanks for your leadership on this. I, I think you pushing the whole industry is much appreciated because if someone doesn't push us, I think we'll continue to revert back to, to, to what's our normal uh, cause here. You know, as a payer, uh, and specifically for us, not many, I don't know if everyone knows, but a significant amount of our business is Medicare Advantage. Uh, and Medicare Advantage serves uh, a needy population in many different ways, and the, and the 
ability to share payment that encourages the outcome is an important part of that. We see our role as really providing three resources to the uh, to our provider partners. One is around the ability for us to offer payment that incentivizes, and so uh, to encourage whether it's upside, downside risk, as you say in in the um, uh, number four, or in path to risk, as we call it, which is really would be in the in the two three area, to encourage uh, individuals to to take that step. And what we find is. Uh, not everyone's ready. Uh, I think whether it's their systems, their their risk tolerance to their ability to comprehend what it means. So we then support uh, the payment model with uh, technology uh, so that they can take information that is more, uh, that traditionally is in the EMR and claim system and, and be able to bring that together so that they can be able to manage that risk and manage it at their level. But then the third thing is the how to do it. And so pro providing resources, we have about 500 individuals that go daily to um, individuals that are on a path to risk. Now, obviously, we don't need to help Chris Chen and his uh, organization, but there are many organizations out there that are needing help. And uh, through joint policy board meetings that we have on a monthly basis, through uh, the ability to provide social workers and others in the practices, um, then in addition, obviously, to be able to take the information and put action to it. And we feel, as a payer, if we can provide support in that transition from payment to technology to, to resources, we can move this along. Because we, we don't want to do what was done in the 90s, where we just give them a contract and say, go do it. Mm -hmm. it's much, that's uh, not really our responsibility. Our responsibility is wrap our arms around them and help them support in those major areas. Great. Thank you. And, and Chris, uh, obviously, you've got a lot of experience as well with uh, moving to new payment models and new care models, new care models for uh, some vulnerable populations. Uh, what, what's most critical and what can the land do to help? So at Chen Med, <clears throat> you know, we take care of the old, the poor, and the sick, and we give them concierge medicine on steroids. <laughs> and as a result, we uh, were able to bring down across a plethora of geographies, uh, we're about to enter our 15th city, and we, we've been able to reduce hospitalizations by about 30 to 50 percent. You can imagine the downside uh, or the, the benefit to the patients and, of course, in cost as well. And we're able to do that repeatedly. And we think that we require three things um, in order to be successful. The first thing is, is courage. Um, the second thing is a platform. Um, and the third thing is training. So let's talk about courage for a moment. We fundamentally believe that you cannot practice schizophrenically. You cannot have a doctor go into one room and practice a fee-for-service methodology and, and then go into another room and practice at global full-risk value-based care. And let me make this real for you. We tend to think of fee-for-service as immediate gratification. You pull a lever, you get a cookie. You pull a lever, you get a cookie. You pull a lever, you get a cookie. Um, now what we do is when, when folks come in and we say, well, this is a completely different model of care. The philosophy is fundamentally the opposite. It's delayed gratification. So we ask our physicians to pull multiple levers. And the more complex the patient, the more customized those levers are, but with the promise that there is a very large prize for both the patient and the provider together. That's a fundamental shift in, in, in thinking. And so you can't have your foot in the boat and the foot on, on the dock at the same time. You got to make the jump. So that's courage. Second piece is the platform. The platform <clears throat> goes in two different categories. One is, I think of as a, you need the right payer platform. One who's gonna give you not only the, the aligned financial incentives, uh, but also the, the, the data, the necessary data and the information to do that, but not just in one geography, across multiple geographies. Uh, you know, Bruce runs a company that does this particularly well. Um, <clears throat> but the other side of the platform is, <clears throat> How, how do you get the right information to the provider at the right time, right in front of the patient at the right point? That's critical. So that's the second piece, that's the platform. The third thing is the training. What we have discovered is that medical schools, residency programs, fellowship programs, they are training doctors for fee-for-service, for immediate gratification. Pull the lever, get a cookie. It's exactly what they're doing. And then they go out into the community and they, they practice fee-for-service. And what we've discovered is that there's a large number of things that they are being trained to do that actually do not improve outcomes, and in many cases, worsen outcomes. 
So what we've discovered is that we actually, when providers join us, it takes us about four to five months to deprogram <laughs> physicians from fever service methodologies, and then takes about four or five months to reprogram them. And that's the training component too. So again, you think you need courage, you gotta jump into the boat. You need the right platform. And then number three, you need the right training. Great, uh, Chris, thanks for that summary. I wanna come back to those uh, platform points that resonates with what Bruce said too, uh, and things that the land may be able to help advance more, more generally. Um, uh, first though, Susan, um, you all have, do a lot of work that goes beyond just focusing on alternative payment models uh, and just focusing on things like decreasing emergency department visits, but really taking a holistic approach to care. So you need to say a little bit more about that and how the, the, the LAN uh, and its goals fit into to, to your own uh, efforts. Yeah. Sure, sure. I think as many of you may know, uh, Plaintree is a patient advocacy organization started by a patient back in the 70s. And our role, I think, in this is to make sure that the patient and family voice never gets lost as we look at things, including payment reform. And because so much of the focus tends to be on clinical improvements, on driving down readmission rates, uh, driving down infection rates, which is all very important, uh, we just wanna make sure that we don't also forget that there's a patient-centric piece to this. And if we really want this to be successful, if we really wanna create a patient-centered healthcare delivery system, we have to make sure that we're uh, addressing patients' preferences and patients' needs as they express them. And what that means to me is that we've got to take on the challenge of really engaging and activating patients in their own care and their own care decisions and supporting the education that's necessary to do that in a meaningful way. And so, you know, I think about if you want patients, for instance, to embrace value-based care models, I mean, to them it looks like less care, less choice. We have to be more transparent about some of the risks that are inherent to delivering that care. We have to help people understand more care does not necessarily mean better care. You know, for example, 10 years ago, I'm on vacation with my mom and my sisters and my mom had a stroke. We ended up in a hospital. She was there for four days and on day three, the nurses started to talk about the discharge. And my sister, who's you know, very you know, smart, well-educated, but not in healthcare, was appalled by the idea that mom was gonna get discharged on day four. She thought, oh my gosh, this is the safest place is for her to be in the hospital. She needs to stay here longer. I had to explain to her the infection risks in a hospital and how they increased exponentially with every day she was in the hospital. She just had no clue about those risks. And most people have no clue about those risks because we're not really good about sharing them. And so I think that's where that education and engagement piece comes in. Maybe if we had been involved in the daily rounds, if we had been involved in the shift change discussions, if we as a family had been involved in the care plan development and the discharge plan development, maybe we would have had a better understanding and appreciation for the fact that a longer stay in the hospital is not a good thing necessarily. And so a lot of the work that Plaintree does now is focused on helping healthcare providers, hospitals, physician practices, clinics, to implement the kinds of engagement practices that we think will make patients and families potentially better able to engage in their own care decisions in a way that's meaningful. Uh, and so I, I do think that having the kind of a a model that we're talking about with Elan, I think there's a place to also look at what, what are the rewards and recognitions for providers and provider organizations that take that extra step or go that extra mile. And so Plaintree has developed this evidence-based, executable framework for excellence in patient-centered practice at the organizational level to try to incentivize and to provide a roadmap to providers of how do you do that? What does that look like? How do you meaningfully engage patients and their families? What are the structures that you've got to put into place? And then we publicly recognize those providers that go that extra mile, that have put into place patient and family partnership councils who do actually involve families in multidisciplinary rounds, invite them to, to be there at the bedside during shift change discussions, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe most importantly, those organizations that have really embraced shared decision making. Because in my opinion, that's one of the foundational pieces of how we engage patients and families in their own care decisions. We've gotta start doing a better job at that. And I mean, the evidence is there. 
I mean, most of us probably have stories that underscore this, right? I mean, my dad had a prostate biopsy scheduled for him a couple years ago when at 80, he had a PSA done by his PCP at his annual visit, and it showed a high PSA rate. Well, of course, every 80-year-old guy has a high <laughs> PSA rate, but he didn't want a biopsy. And there was never a conversation with his doctor about, should I do this, should I not? What are the pros and cons? I had that conversation with him. Uh, and when I asked him, well, what would you do if this biopsy came back positive and you've got cancer? He said, nothing. All right, case closed. We canceled the biopsy, we saved Medicare some dollars, and we decreased his risk. So we've got to be, you know, we've got to get more serious about that. The evidence is there. And, you know, we work with hospitals and care providers all over the world. I just wanted to read this one short quote. This was from a BMJ article. We work with a lot of uh, providers in the Netherlands where shared decision making is really starting to take off. And this was a profile of their five year pilot. They've got 25 active decision aids being used throughout their hospital. And this was the administrator's quote. He said, more time for discussion and decision making prevents unnecessary surgeries and has led to a 13% decrease in gallbladder surgery alone and a 17% decrease in overall cost of care. So to me, it's, it's really imperative that when we think about healthcare payment reform, we have got to figure out how do we incentivize these sorts of evidence-based practices that engage patients and families in their own care. You know, let's, let's not just talk about a patient-centered care system. Let's use this as an opportunity to actually create it. Yeah, I really appreciate that emphasis on specific steps to truly engage patients and reflect what they want. And Nick, not that you're not interested in that, you're trying to cure uh, some very serious diseases, but if I, if I could just go to um, Adam next um, and then come back to Nick, I have a method for this. Um, Nick. Thanks for letting me know. That. Uh, right? uh, well, 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 Adam, uh, you've been taking some new steps at Walmart. Uh, to try to, I think, do the sort of thing that, yeah. that Susan was just talking about from a little bit different standpoint. Uh, you're, you're an employer, uh, not a direct uh, consumer advocate, though I think you'd say you're, you're trying to work on uh, behalf of uh, value for your, uh, for, for, your, um, uh, for, your, for the people in the, the uh, Walmart workforce. Can you say a little bit about how you think those efforts can contribute to the land goals? And where Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and I'll be quick, so you get a, you no, get a shot. <laughs> and again, as CEO, of Walmart, I'm not the CEO. The CEO of Walmart, we are ably staffed in that capacity. <laughs> um, what we think is an important complement to the land's efforts on payment reform and price transparency is quality transparency, and that informs a tremendous amount of our focus going forward. In addition to everything else that we're doing, and so so uh, you know, why is that? Well, we all know uh, the statistics that are out there, and the one that, that just rings in our head, rings in my head, is 30% of all care is unnecessary, and there's different components of that. But it's a really stunning percentage when you think about it. There's so much work to try to tame trend and lower it down by a couple points, but a third. We may not get to all of it, but that informs our thinking. And again, so, so how can we get at that? Um, uh, coupled with obviously all the complexity in the system, a as you mentioned, we have a lot of associates. We are literally in every MSA. We employ people at every age band, every generation. Uh, we're the largest employer in 22 states. So uh, we really see care from a variety of angles. And so where can we make those steps? And it really is to go after that 30% because we've seen that in our own experience. Uh, the Harvard Business Review published an article uh, about our Centers of Excellence program where we have direct contracts with a number of the best hospitals in the country for certain uh, significant events. And we saw that of the people who were diagnosed to need um, spine surgery by their local physician, when they were sent to one of the Centers of Excellence, over half of those patients were deemed not to need surgery and went back with a less invasive treatment. And you think about the impact to that associate. And it's a scary procedure, surgery. It costs money. It costs time. It requires caregivers to give their time. It is a tremendously human impact to them. And so we have seen that uh, in our experience, and again, informs our thinking. So 
perhaps, Mark, uh, this is what you wanted. So, so what are we doing about that? We have a, a lot of things we're implementing right now <laughs> back at the ranch, but a couple that I think are particularly germane to the conversation today. And one is uh, that we, uh, and we just announced this a couple weeks ago, we are in a uh, certain number of markets and certain specialties. We are, in a sense, uh, with a third party, curating a network of physicians with a higher track record of practicing more appropriate, more clinically effective care according to the protocols and best practices of their own experts in their field. Not by me, not by Walmart, but by these others. Key to that, and we looked at a variety of companies who were trying to build to this model, is that we picked a company whose data and metrics will be public. So all the physicians will see how they scored. And we think that will also not just ensure that our associates get the best care possible, but that the community will see a, a lift because there's studies out there that show that when physicians see how they fare relative to their peers, a meaningful cohort of them improve their practice. We, we know that there's a lot of risks here. We know that there's a lot of, uh, there's a weight behind this effort, but we believe that and the data informs that this will drive better care. And we need to couple that certainly with some of the payment reforms we have, direct payments, bundled payments. I can talk about that in a little bit. Um, the other thing we're doing is an expanded telehealth pilot where beyond moving from simple sick, where people at 3 a.m., kids got an earache and it's great, you, you get on your iPad and, and you, get a, you get yourself taken care of. But now you're gonna be able to have your standing physician available to you on the phone or the iPad who knows you can help you manage chronic conditions more than the simple sick for $4. Uh, we're also going to pilot um, in the Carolinas another initiative, um, uh, a personal health assistant, if you will, one phone number, one whatever, to help guide you through your care. What care do you need? How do you find a physician who, again, is practicing care along these lines? We think uh, th these are perhaps some of, of the items you, you might have been thinking about, Mark, that we think all align with the goals of better outcomes, lower costs, through a transparent model. Great, so I, I appreciate that perspective too. And Nick, now I, I do wanna to come to you. Uh, um, we heard from Adam about some steps that they're taking, I think along the lines of um, Susan's comments of, of helping uh, consumers, patients find the, the, the best care and be supported in, in getting it, getting the best outcomes at the lowest cost. You're trying to help uh, create some, some new healthcare consumers, a different kind of healthcare consumers, where it's really about uh, improved outcomes, not just um, managing very serious conditions without a cure. But that cure has led to the, the possibility of these cures, led some, to some concerns about rising healthcare costs and, and how it can really fit into uh, um, a healthcare system that currently already has a, a lot of inefficiencies and, and, and unnecessary costs. A lot of sensitivity about doing this right. What, what are you, uh, how are we gonna do that? And then does it fit with the themes we're talking about today? Wow, you're putting a lot on me. I, I just yeah. wanna point out, when I looked at this, I thought this was sort of a hair club for men thing with like five <laughs> options here. You know, uh, you know, this is what I could look like if I just dressed better and, and had better hair. Uh, my wife's in the audience, so uh, sorry, honey. Um, you got what you got. Um, so I, I will, will definitely jump into it, and I, I do sort of not fit up here in that regard, but I do think trying to make sure we have a system that is very much patient-centric and very much focused on innovation. And the first thing I'll do is up here representing, if you will, biopharma or the pharma industry is, and I think part of the reason you like to put me up here is I immediately distance myself from a lot of my colleagues. And the reason is I actually think the pharma industry and the biotech industry in many cases has done a really good, good job uh, earning their reputation. And that's not a popular comment, but I do think there's just been a lot of unfortunate behavior uh, over the last many years where you effectively are going down an erosion of trust because of taking advantage of the system, because of things like pricing because you can, and effectively uh, doing price increases. And I can go down the list of things that personally I don't think are the right thing to do and over rewards the innovator. So I think there's an element of that that needs to be considered. At the same time, when you consider it, how do you not stunt or ruin innovation or stunt or ruin the ability to have market forces uh, that really, I think, are an important uh, motivator 
to create the medicines that we all want to have available to ourselves and our children and our future generations. So that's an aspect of what we've been focusing on. And, and I try to get people to say, listen, the shiny object is people like Bluebird. And I'll get to it in a minute where we have highly innovative, very expensive medicine that is now approved in Europe, hopefully in the US soon. And to focus on that for the right reasons, as opposed to saying, well, where are the other parts of the industry we really do need to solve the healthcare? is that to have the media and the politicians say, wow, a million dollars a year is this horrific, bad example. And I would actually stipulate, I'm not sure that's the right way to think about it. Really got to look a little bit deeper and say, is that what's wrong with the drug industry? Or is that actually a great example of doing the right thing where you have a highly innovative medicine that can make a huge transformative difference and actually is extremely cost effective? Obviously, you know where I sit on that, but at the same time, I think it's important to have transparency, which has been brought up many a times, and our industry is horrible at that, and I think it's inexcusable. And in many cases, I'm pushing for transparency and actually find out it's illegal, right? But we're working everything we can to say, listen, just let it all be known, right? There's lots of middlemen in our industry that our industry likes to point at and say they're the reason that we have a, you know, high list prices because they're demanding high list because their rebate, their earnings comes from that, so it's a perverse incentive. That is true, but industry needs to clean house as well and needs to start behaving a little bit better. So we're doing our part, Mark, and that's Bluebird. We're a one-time, potentially curative gene therapy company, and we like to reference the most easy one for people to understand is sickle cell disease. What if you can have a one-time, potentially curative treatment? But think about that. That's a lifelong uh, disease. It also dramatically shortens lifespan by, let's say, average age in the U.S. is 44 years old. So the extra 30, 40 years of life, how do you value that? And if it's a one-time treatment that basically the manufacturing plant sits in your bone marrow producing the solution, how do you charge for that? What is the appropriate way to value that? And we thought, well, this is a really awesome way to totally abuse the system. Because who wouldn't want to have that? And we can basically just close our eyes, sit in the boardroom, and just kind of say, here, here we go. Right? And it's probably the most profitable near-term thing we can do, and probably many of our investors would love it. It's not the right answer. It's not the approach we've taken. We have the benefit of having no revenue. I don't even know what it is. We have no profit. I don't know what that is either. So we can say, shit, let's just do what we got to do. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's what we did. And we have a board that allowed us to roll out a pricing reimbursement strategy that says the following things under these principles. One, we want to be a catalyst for change. Two, we want to look at affordability, not just for the individual, but also for the system. That's what pharma loves <laughs> to forget. right? So whether you have 10 patients or you have 3 million patients, it turns out there's actually a difference in how much you make. right? Third is also to reward innovation unapologetically. So I'm not for low prices. What I am for is reasonable value-based prices. And then just don't do stupid shit. My mm -hmm. comms guys like to say, don't say, say, don't do stupid stuff, mm -hmm. right? Well, no, it's just silly behavior that our industry can't do. So we rolled out a, basically a model that's the following way, which we have valued our medicine based on quality of life and life extension. We all know how to do the math on that. The cost offsets, meaning the things that will no longer have to happen for a sickle cell patient in the system, we basically said that's 50% of how we could value our medicine, which is probably in the order of three to four million. We said that is for the system to gain. We're not going to base our price on that. We're going to look exclusively at the intrinsic value, which is quality of life, life extension. That's about two million in the case of thalassemia, which is, this is an example of. And then we said, well, how are we going to look at that? Because that's a huge cost density issue for most payers. Right? How do you pay all that up front or some portion of that? So we said, no, we're going to spread it over five years, five equal installments, and only the first payment is guaranteed. So four out of five is not. 80% of the price is on a binary outcome. Either you are still cured of your disease, defined by transfusions that you get regularly, or not. And if you start getting transfusions or you progress, you don't pay two, three, four, five payments. That means up front, we prospectively define the value of our treatment, so there's no runaway train. That's what our industry also loves, right? You price and forget it. And then the next thing you know, you know, making millions on any given patient, or you're making 20 million a year on a 20 billion a year on certain medicines. Not the way we wanted to go. Define it up front. Everybody wins at the end of the day. And it turns out, unfortunately, in the U.S., what I just described to you is, is largely illegal, right? Um, and that part of that is because of best price, right? If we were all thal patients in here and you all had different performances and you all were part of the U. Let's say the government system, we'd have a problem, right? Because Whoever got the lowest price in here, everybody would get that price. So we need exemptions. We're working very hard with Mark and others to say, we're looking to give you an 80% discount. We're looking to go at risk. Work with us here. Right. And that is all about its core, shifting to paying for outcomes, not paying for volume of, of, uh, of, of gene therapies that you do, but paying right. for the actual impact 
on a population that you treat. So there's a common theme across everyone on this stage. And uh, I know you all had the chance to participate in the first meeting of this uh, new CEO forum for, uh, for the Learning and Action Network. Um, these themes came up there too, themes around um, how can we work together to build better platforms to support um, uh, value-based care and, and uh, delivery systems, including the providers. How can we better engage the, the, the consumers uh, and patients in, in these efforts? I'm wondering if you all could, could talk a little bit more about uh, steps that we might take together around some of these themes. Um, uh, one of them was it's going to be a lot easier for healthcare providers, maybe a little bit less courage needed, Chris, if, if a lot of payers are, are, are moving in kind of the same direction uh, that, that you all have talked about today. Um, what are some of the steps that could help get there? Um, uh, data, data sharing and, uh, and data standards have, have come up, uh, um, uh, alignment on quality, reform approaches, measurement and the like. Uh, maybe Chris, start with you and, uh, and Bruce. And then I want to turn to the consumer side with, uh, uh, and patient side. with. Sure, so I think that the, uh, there's three main components. Uh, first of all, I think you have to lower the barriers to entry. <clears throat> um, you know, it's, uh, there, there is a lot of barriers for a provider or a doctor that wants to go into it. There are financial barriers, and then there are technologic uh, barriers. The, the financial barriers, I think that one of the things that we, we are in 100% of our business is Medicare Advantage. And there is a risk adjustment model that works with, that, that allows you to take care of the sickest patients. There's typically about a 12 to 18 month delay in that. And so if you're a smaller company, I mean, uh, Chenmin is much larger now, but if you're a smaller company, it's very hard for you to float the dollars for 12 to 18 months to allow that. And in addition, to make the technologic investments to actually get that data uh, from a great platform, a payer platform, and then actually present it to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, the doctor at the right point of care, that's actually quite costly, mainly because it's, there's not a lot of transparent data flow and um, many other barriers, but we have to open up some of those barriers. Second thing is, we've, we've, you've heard Secretary say this, you, you've got to push downside risk. Um, you have to make risk real. Um, and, and, and you're not at risk until you take downside risk. It's all upside. The third thing is, is we have a lot of data that value-based care is better care. The results are there. Um, we've published that we can reduce hospitalizations by 30 to 50% compared with fee-for-service. And so value-based care is better care. It's better care. We've got to figure out how to take people in a fee-for-service environment and make them less comfortable. You gotta get rid of the control group now because the evidence supports that value-based care gives you better results. And so how do we make fee-for-service more uncomfortable. That is a major challenge for this country today. Um, if you talk to large uh, uh, systems, many of the people who are running those large systems are actually thinking the exact opposite. How do we slow down progress so that we, we don't have to jump into value-based care because we're very comfortable. We're very comfortable in pulling a lever and getting a cookie. So what can we do to make that slightly less comfortable to then promote people towards a better model of care that delivers better results for patients and for America? Uh, Bruce? Thoughts? Yeah, I, <clears throat> there's many different different uh, aspects. I mean, I think first, just uh, I think getting some consistency in the industry. Uh, and uh, I'll take responsibility of our industry where there are different quality standards, there's different data standards. And the more we can bring uh, that together, I think the more impactful we'll have because it'll make it easier for, for a provider like uh, Chris's group or others to service many different providers as opposed to just Humana, for example, and, and on a Humana platform. Uh, so I think the continued push around interoperability, and I, I, and I know, you know, our teams are working with a number of different payers in the, in the community, but being defining quality is an important part of that because I think different quality measurements create uh, inefficiencies in the system and then in addition, the um, inability for people to contract consistently. So I think those two things, if the land could take that on. I do, I do want to uh, just amplify what Chris says. I think this barrier, because of the business model, is a tough thing to work through. Uh, I, think I, as I think being a CEO of a, a large hospital system today is a really hard job. Um, you have a significant amount of fixed asset base that is that is a, the inherent part of that business. They are an infrastructure into the community that supports the community, whether it's jobs to 
to offering a, you know, an institution that is able to serve some very sick people. And being able to make that transition is difficult. And I, I listen, we're working with a lot of uh, um, institutions that we are walking in their shoes, realizing what they're trying to convert to and the difficulties of doing that. But the more we can help the larger institutions that have fixed assets and this transition, the better I think the country will be. I think when you don't have assets and you're a primary care doctor and you got, you know, six seats in your reception area and you got, you know, a, you know, three pods in your in your office. It's a lot easier to change than having 4,000 beds that you got to keep fill, filled every day. And I think, as Elaine thinks about this, just how can we help those institutions make that change? Because I think as they make that change, they will bring a lot of other people with them. Yeah, I see, saw a lot of. Um directions for these action steps at the land, including uh, both finding some of those best practices, helping to, uh, I guess, make the courage uh, easier and getting out of the, 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 the pulling the lever, getting the cookie uh, easier, and then shared approaches around uh, data standards, quality standards, and, and, and the like. Um, one of the things, though, that... Let me just that, add, add to that. I think if you know you have the, uh, the clinical part and the CEO part, you might want to think about a CFO um, area there because I, the, <laughs> yeah. their job is really hard and if you can maybe get them to start pushing the, that's right. the, when, the, when, the industry will be Well when they start seeing the business model I think that's, yeah. that's, a, that's well, a really Bruce, good point. That is the can secret. I ask a question? <laughs> that is the yeah. secret. Bruce can I ask you how much does being a public company or sort of having to answer to investors on the financial side limit your ability to do what you'd like to do? Maybe yeah. you have less maybe requirements than you do out of curiosity. Um, I, it, it's, it's one of these healthy tensions, I would say, but I, I think if you have a purpose and a value and, a, and uh, the ability to navigate through the various different aspects, I, I, think, I think it's important. My philosophy is, listen, the system's broken. It is broken. And everyone on this stage and everyone in this room has a responsibility to fix it. And as I, I have to report to my shareholders at a board meeting yesterday, I have to report to them. I get that, I understand it. But at the same time, I have a responsibility to advance the, the healthcare system. So if I'm being um, uh, held to one constituency, I'm not doing my job and I shouldn't be in my job. And so I, I do agree there's always an excuse. Listen, I got shareholders there three, every three months they're looking at for something, but but it, listen, I got to run my business to, to for that. But I got to run my business to advance advance uh, what we're here for. And yeah. uh, wanted to come back to the patient and, and consumer side in this. Um, consumers, first of all, if you look nationwide, they they don't know that much. I mean, they got better things to worry about, other things to worry about than category three Bs and, uh, and and things like that. Uh, on the other hand, what we're talking about here is some fundamentally different and for patients uh, intended to be significantly better ways to, to get their care and, and spend their money or avoid spending their money on uh, on health care. So back to, to Susan and uh, and Adam, um, um, some uh, I know we had some discussion at the CEO forum on getting effective decision making tools adopted. That's part of the could be a key part of the, the platform support that the uh, the land helps provide. But um, maybe some other thoughts about um, uh, moving forward on that. Sure, um, sure. So that's actually absolutely a critical point. I'm so glad you brought it up. The complexity of the health system, the health insurance system, it is daunting. As you mentioned, we've got uh, you know, more than a million hourly associates. And, and a lot of us in this room, we, we ourselves are confused, but we have access into support that they may not have. And so it is a front and center um, priority as we look to fundamentally simplify the experience and to find the words that will resonate with people so that when we talk about the, the, this uh, curated network, we don't use words like that when we're talking to real people. Right? Um, we did a lot of research with our associates to find the words that would convey at, 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 a, at a visceral level what we're trying to do to get them to have better care. Um, and, and so we really have focused very much on that because the system is scary for a lot of people. So what are the metrics is too fancy a word for how we're going to speak to our associates in the ways we have tried a lot of uh, unique communication efforts uh, through digital media and whatnot to try to get them at a really fundamental level to understand better care. These doctors, these other approaches, this is better for you. 
And it's great to see Walmart and other employers that are part of the CEO forum and part of the, the new LAN efforts focusing on sharing some of those resources and getting them adopted more widely. Susan, uh, yeah, just hoping to, you're gonna contribute to that a lot too. Yeah, just to build on Adam's points, you know, most people in our country, most people in this audience have uh, more information when we're trying to decide what hairdresser to use or what car mechanic to go to than we do around healthcare providers, right? I mean, I, I was trying to help my mom find a new doctor when she moved to Florida, and I ended up on Yelp reading other patient reviews, and that's how we decided. No clinical quality data whatsoever to guide that decision. And, and so I think one of the opportunities is, you know, let's, let's take that one on. How do we make sure that the average citizen, the average you know, person in this room has access to good, understandable information when you're trying to make these sometimes life critical decisions? I mean, I, I talk a lot now about who's going to develop TripAdvisor for healthcare. Right? Don't we need something like that? I mean, we know what sorts of platforms consumers like to use. They like Facebook, they like TripAdvisor, you know, they like Yelp. How come our industry, how come the leadership in our industry hasn't taken that on and developed something like that? Because I can tell you, I've, I mean, as much as I personally like Hospital Compare, nobody that I know that's not in healthcare understands how to use it. So there's, there's a tap. So, and Adam, you wanted to add to this, yeah, and then tiny, this is gonna be our, our last word. Tiny, for, tiny. Yeah. So uh, the Yelp comment uh, struck a nerve with me because we, we have lots of data to show Yelp and then other ways. So you know, we spent a lot of time talking about morbidity and mortality and the effect of logarithmic transformations on the data to, to parse the, the universe of providers. Truly, we had those conversations. We're not having those conversations with our associates. You know what? In the way that we're rolling this out, it's green and red. And, and mm -hmm. that, that's how we're trying, and, and that's version one. We hope version two will be something else, yeah. but we want it to be easy and understandable. And, and yeah. we're gonna keep building on that together. Yeah. I, I, um, I wanna um, mention one other topic that, that we didn't really get to on this panel, and that's getting to uh, critical mass in a, in, in a region or market or, or state. Um, that's gonna be a topic for our uh, afternoon uh, keynote session uh, using North Carolina as an example, and the North Carolina participants are uh, one of the regions that's going to be a, a part of this uh, new land uh, supported effort as well. Uh, but for right now, I wanted to, to thank you all for, for your time and effort, both for your national leadership on these issues and for bringing your organizations to bear on these further steps that we think we can take together. Uh, we're definitely not there yet, but as you heard from Secretary Azar this morning, and as you heard from uh, everybody with me on the panel today, uh, we are gonna work hard and we're gonna take some new steps to get there through the LAN in supporting all of the activities that you all are undertaking around the country. So uh, thank you again to the panel and thanks to all of you who are here for part of this uh, shared LAN effort to advance uh, value, improve outcomes, and lower costs in healthcare. Thank you all very much. All right. Now, we are, uh, we are into a 15 minute break now. If you look at the, the LAN app, the agenda, there, there is uh, a number of choices you can make around different issues related to these transformation goals uh, for the LAN. So please enjoy the rest of the day, and I'll see you later this afternoon. <laughs>